when we hit the beach, we knew there was no doubt in our mind that we had to take that beach. Things like we went through are just things you don't forget. I mean, it's impossible. Well, when the war broke out, I was still in high school. I was 16 years old. I didn't think the war would last six months, really, when I first heard about it. Two years later, I had graduated from high school and went to an aircraft school to take the same schooling that the Army Air Corps men did. And I went down there trying to get in the Air Force, and I was drafted in the Army. Although he had his sights set on the skies, Harold McMurrin was sent to the United States Army with the 546th Maintenance Company. The closest he would come to an airplane would be as a repairman for a height finder, an instrument used to determine the altitude of enemy aircraft. But to where Harold would be deployed was still a mystery. The day before you ship out, if you got ODs, you're going to the Atlantic side. If you got khakis, you're going to the Pacific side. They didn't have to tell you. When you went through there and they started issuing you those clothing, you knew where you was going. And we didn't want to go to the Pacific, so we lucked out in that respect of going to the European theater. Harold may have counted himself lucky, but before he would ever set foot in war-torn Europe, the war would find him. We were sent down to the English coast. That was one of the worst places that you could be because the Germans had uh, Air Force bases just across the channel. And they would bomb us just about every night. And we had foxholes to get in. But if one of those 500-pound bombs dropped within 100 yards of you, it'd bounce you out of that hole just like you had springs in your shoes. And you'd crawl back in another one, hit close, do the same thing. But the nightly bombings were only a glimpse of what was to come. Soon, Harold would find himself advancing, straight into the jaws of death. Since late 1940, the Allied forces had been chipping away at Adolf Hitler's global conquest, finally achieving victory in northern Africa and a successful invasion of Italy. But the Allies knew that the French coast was the gateway to victory in Europe, and in June of 1944, they were finally ready to take it. Operation Overlord would be the largest seaborne invasion in history, landing over 150,000 troops with intent to drive Hitler's armies back from where they came. Germany knew the invasion was coming. The only question was where. Hitler was determined that we were gonna invade up at Calais. And he kept his two SS divisions up there, even when his generals told him that we was coming in on the beach. He said, that's just a decoy down there. But the real decoy was just off the coast of Calais, where the Allies amassed a false army under the supposed leadership of General George Patton to draw Hitler's attention away from the beaches of Normandy. Up on Calais on the English side, they were putting tanks made of rubber, blow them up, trucks and everything up there, just stacking them in there. The deception had worked, and the defending German forces were split. In the early morning of June 6th, the invasion was underway. We loaded on the uh, LST, and uh, we started to move out. But it seemed like anything that could go wrong, did go wrong. 
the Navy bombardment and Allied bombers missed crucial German targets, leaving the enemy defenses largely intact. American tanks sank beneath the waves before they could reach the shore, and the airborne paratroopers deployed behind enemy lines were left scattered and disoriented by adverse weather and enemy firepower. The 101st and 82nd Airborne Division, they dropped before daylight, and that was a disaster. I went in at 7 a.m. The bodies were drowned and been killed while they were still in the water. We went in way, way too early because they had not taken as much of the beach as they thought they would. So when we got there, we actually became infantry. We were not maintenance, we were infantry. With the battle still raging when he reached the shore, Harold was forced to abandon his equipment and join in the fight. The Germans had just about every inch of that beach covered with a machine gun fire. You could see it, the bullets hitting all around you in the sand, sand just popping up all around you. There was very few of us that made it through without getting hit. No further from me to you. You just see him just blood and guts everywhere. It hit with a machine gun, 50 caliber machine gun. And you'd be splattered with his blood. Not no way to really clean it up from you. And you're wondering, trying to find out where that fire came from, and maybe you could return some fire but they were firing from so many different directions. You never knew which one actually hit you, buddy. He just was praying he wasn't the next one that they hit. Hear them hollering, begging for help from the guys that was wounded and some that was wounded trying to get up under a sand dune that was there that was the best protection that was there at that time. But uh, it's hard to describe your feelings when you see something like that. And the people that got less credit for what they did was the medics. They did not have very much training either, but they did a good job. You could holler for a medic, and the chances are there'd be one there in just about five minutes or less, because they need that holler. In spite of tremendous casualties, failed plans, and fierce German resistance, the battered Allied soldiers reorganized, improvised, and persevered until their objectives were completed and the beaches were taken. D-Day may have looked vastly different than expected, but the gates were now open and victory seemed just over the horizon. When we hit the beach, we knew there was no doubt in our mind that we had to take that beach. Because if we didn't, everybody would be a loser but we would sacrifice everything we had to take that beach. And I think that's the reason we got it. Hey everyone, I'm Josh from Memoirs of World War II, and I just wanna say thank you for watching this episode and also give you an opportunity to join up with what we're doing. We're dedicated to reaching as many veterans of the Second World War as we can, both here in the U.S. and across the world, but we're running out of time. The youngest World War II veterans are in their 90s, and every day we're losing more and more of them. So here are three simple ways that you can join with us. First, consider supporting us through Patreon. Patreon is a subscription-based service that keeps projects like this one going. Second, you can share these videos with your family and friends. It's a great way to honor these veterans and get these stories out there. 
And finally, consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks again for your support and thank you for watching.